right, fellow babies, welcome back to Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. If you're watching this real time, it's because you're a Sifted.net subscriber. Stay that way. If you're watching this on YouTube, you should be a Sifted.net subscriber. You would have seen it last week and you wouldn't have had to read about it on the internets. And you don't have any right to bitch and moan about anything I say because you're not paying for it. Thanks for joining us. Sifted.net has something coming up for the holidays. You can get a gift subscription. You can request it. If you'd like to request it on the site, you can go to sifted.net slash gifted, or you can put this on your Amazon wish list and you can request that one of your loved ones honor you with the privilege of making you a sifted.net member so you can see Pactor Factor real time when it's broadcast. Those of you who are not on sifted.net, we understand everybody can't afford it or maybe chooses not to afford it. We'll have it on YouTube a week later. And so there's Pactor loving for all of Pactor's fellow babies. Thanks for joining us on Pactor Factor. Let's get to the questions. All right, this week, our first question comes from sifted.net from Disturbed Swan. It's a good question. Are physical games and physical game sales going to become extinct within the next 10 years? And by the way, if physical games exist, somebody will sell them. So you don't need to qualify physical games and physical game sales as separate things. Are companies like GameStop eventually going to go out of business or will there still be a place for them in a digital future? All right, that's a long answer. I apologize in advance because it's a pretty complicated question. Um, I'm gonna let you guys in on a little, little bit of trivia. Uh, the music CD reached its peak sales level in the US in 1997. And in 1997, we Americans consumed 1 billion, 10 million music CDs. 1 billion, 10, 10, so 10, 10 million. In 2014, so 17 years later, that number dwindled to 183 million music CDs. Now I'm using 14 because 15 is not over yet, so I can't look it up. It's certainly gonna be down this year. It might be 150 or 120, it's down for sure. But the reason I picked 1997, aside from the fact that it really was the peak, is that's the year that Napster, Grokster, and Kazaa decided to make ripping off music really easy for the average consumer. So anybody who had a PC connected to the worldwide interweb could rip off music. And there was peer-to-peer -peer theft, essentially, of music files. And so music sales dwindled precipitously after 1997. And in 2001, Apple came up with the concept of the iPod, and they came up with the concept of iTunes, and you could buy a song one at a time at the time, 99 cents. And people felt like, oh shoot, rather than steal a song, if it's only a dollar, I'll buy it. Because everybody feels guilty. They understand that recording artists should get paid. I mean, they're doing something that we treasure and value, so they deserve to get paid. So the important point of all this is in 19, I'm sorry, in 2014, there were still 183 million CDs sold. That is a shit pot. You can look that up in the dictionary. That's a lot OCDs. And the question is, 17 years after Napster, Grokster, Kazaa, 13 years after the iPod, uh, seven years after the iPhone, why the hell are we still buying CDs? And the answer is, it's a profit deal. The music record labels can still make money selling you a CD. So as long as they can still make money selling you a CD, and as long as there's one, of, one person out there who wants to buy one, they'll make them. So now let's move that into the game world. Are physical game sales going away? They are not going away as long as the video game publishers think somebody will buy the game on DVD. There's always gonna be that person who doesn't trust the internet, doesn't want to put a credit card number out there, doesn't have a high-speed internet connection, doesn't play multiplayer, 
has his console in the basement and can't connect it to the internet, whatever, wants to buy the game and trade it in, oh, hello, 70% of GameStop customers, wants to buy the game and give it away, hello, Pactor, that's what I do with mine, you wish you were one of my neighbors because I give everything away when I'm done, wants to take the game to his friend's house, hello, wants to loan the game to his friend, hello, lots of people, wants to give the game as a gift. So the answer is physical games are going to be around as long as the publishers think they can make a profit. GameStop is going to be around as long as the publishers believe that the event of having a game launch and having people stand in line and having reviewers embargoed and really getting excited about the event makes money for them. So the answer is within the next 10 years, maybe, probably not. Is GameStop eventually going to go out of business? Yes. Are they going out of business in the next 10 years? Probably not. Will there still be a place for them in a digital future? I don't think so. Uh, they would like you to believe that if we go all digital all the time, all download, that grandma's going to come in and buy her gift card at GameStop. The truth is, if, if everything is digital, grandma is even going to figure out that she can buy a gift card on Amazon and she can send you an email with a code and you will know what to do. Um, remember, my kids, who are 15 girls, are going to be grandmas someday. My kids probably aren't buying any physical games for themselves ever again. So when they're grandmas, I'm pretty confident they'll be comfortable going to Amazon and buying a gift card code and emailing it to a friend. And it probably doesn't have to be emailed. They'll probably go to Amazon and it'll be imprinted in their friend's brain. I mean, we, who knows how we're going to work in the future. So eventually, sure, physical entertainment does go away. But 10 years, probably not. We have a, one, of, one of the easier questions I'm going to answer from sifted.net from Thomas. I love that we have guys on sifted.net that have a first name. Uh, I'm going to advise all you prospective sifted.net members when you join, pick a single letter as your name. So there's only 26 of those, but just become A or E. So this should be T. So T, could a big company such as EA or Ubisoft make a console? Or would it be financial suicide? Is there any room in the market for a fourth big console manufacturer? Um, the answer is a big company, let's leave out EA and Ubisoft, absolutely could make the console. Would it be financial suicide? Depends on how big the company is. Um, I would say that your question should have asked me, could a big company like Apple or Amazon make a console? Because they will. Uh, EA and Ubisoft, no prayer. They will not. Uh, they are third-party publishers. They are uh, device agnostic. They are, think of them as making guns and they don't care who's in the war. They'll sell their guns to anybody. So, you know, the arms dealers uh, are perfectly happy selling anybody's, you know, anybody's guns to any buyer. They don't want to be the, one of the guys at war. So you've heard of the console wars. EA and Ubisoft don't want to be in them. They want to, they want to sell weapons to the console manufacturers. Uh, Apple and Amazon both have kind of a, a stake in trying to deliver entertainment in the living room. Um, Amazon, as you know, is the largest bookseller in the world, invented the Kindle, so the e-reader, and they lost their edge on DVDs and music to Apple. Uh, iTunes took over those. I think Amazon with Fire TV is trying to get it back. Apple with Apple TV is trying to retain it, and they obviously have a, a huge advantage in iPads and, uh, and iPhones. So I think those two guys are both going to go after that console market. And I think what's fascinating is you're going to see convergence of devices. So eventually your phone or your iPad or your Surface Pro tablet will be at least as fast as a laptop or a desktop and at least as fast as an Xbox One. And eventually they'll have GPUs that make sense that, that will render these games in you know, full, probably 4K at 120 frames a second. And when that happens, we don't really need consoles. So the question is, 
does that happen in a device like an iPad or does that happen in a device like an Apple TV? But when it happens, Apple becomes the console, not Microsoft or Sony. So I'm curious to see how it works. The, the good news, I suppose, is that everybody hates Apple uh, and by hates, consumers love them. But nobody likes paying Apple 30% of revenue for the privilege of allowing Apple to you know, be the, the conduit for downloading their entertainment. And nobody really likes paying Microsoft or Sony that 30% either. So ultimately, I think you're going to see the publishers, EA and Ubisoft, go direct to consumer. And the interesting thing will be if a device manufacturer can create something that allows you to play a console quality game on your television without a console. So think about a world where you download the game to your PC and you connect your PC to your TV through a Chromecast stick or an Apple TV device and you just run it through Wi-Fi and play the game on your TV screen. What's the difference? I mean, what is a console? A console is just a CPU and a GPU in a box with a controller and a monitor. The TV's the monitor. You can buy a controller from Amazon for 40 bucks. Why do we need the CPU, GPU if we already have one in our house? Look, I think ultimately, if you are NVIDIA and AMD, who are the graphics you know, GPU makers, I mean, AMD makes CPUs and GPUs, or you're Intel, I think you're trying to get into every device manufactured in 2018 and beyond and I think the selling point is, I don't need a PC if I have a phone that's super fast and has great graphic resolution. You may not need the GPU for your tiny phone screen, but you need it for your big screen TV. So why not pack it all on the phone and let the phone power the TV? That's going to happen. I don't know if it's the iPhone 9 or the iPhone 13, but it's going to happen. And when it happens, I think the console manufacturers are in trouble. I don't think they're going away. but they're going to keep trying, but I think, you know, roll back and look at what happened to Nintendo's handheld business as mobile phones became popular, um, as, as smartphones became popular. The 3DS is selling about half as many units as the DS. That's not because Nintendo sucks. That is not because their software is bad. That's because they lost the, you know, one end of the market that is very happy playing on tablets. And if the same thing happens with consoles, where you get a really good experience on your monitor with whatever CPU, GPU you have in the house, and you connect with the Fire TV stick, that's gonna happen. So I, I think it would be financial suicide for anybody to try to compete with Sony and Microsoft. I think Apple and Amazon are intent upon either, in Apple's case, preserving their ecosystem with iTunes, and in Amazon's case, capturing some share with games and so I think they're going to accelerate this arms race and they're going to both uh, launch some type of device that allows you to play games. It may end up being a Fire TV box or an Apple TV that has a super fast CPU GPU combo and that does it for you but it's going to happen and uh, all that's good for gamers it doesn't matter and it's really good for publishers because if you can get the equivalent of a console in your house for 50 bucks or 100 bucks and play super high quality games, you're going to double the market for every game. So everybody's going to make money. It's going to be great for everybody. Okay, got a question from sifted.net from Burko, or if the GH is pronounced Burkuff. Uh, considering sites like Green Man Gaming, G2, <laughs> G2A, etc., could a user-regulated marketplace be a viable alternative? Does it make sense for companies like Valve to allow digital copies of games to be sold and traded between user accounts? You know, it's a tough question. Um, the problem, I think, with games being resold is that the law is pretty clear that if you buy a physical item, that you own it and you can sell it to somebody else. So if you buy a bicycle, you can sell the bicycle to somebody else. If you buy a DVD with a movie on it, you can sell the DVD to somebody else. If you buy a game DVD with a game on it, you can sell it to somebody else. So those can be traded in. 
On the other hand, the law is very clear, and this is U.S. law, it's different in other countries, that if you download a file that is entertainment, you have licensed the right to listen to that file on that device. So when you download a song on iTunes, you own the right to listen to that song as often as you want, and you can download that same file to other Apple devices, but you cannot resell the file. You can resell your iPod, so you can, or your phone, if you choose to, and the person who buys it from you could listen to the same music. There was a U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, I remember the plaintiff was Autodesk, and I don't remember the name of the case, but Autodesk versus somebody, um, where a guy bought a PC that had the Autodesk uh, CAD design software, which costs about 70000 bucks, loaded onto the PC, and the guy bought it and wanted to use it, and Autodesk sued, went to the Supreme Court, and won, saying, nope, you can't buy that because that was a user license. So again, it's the terms of the license that people agree to when they download. So take a look on Valve at what exactly you're buying. And you know they all, they, everybody knows the acronym EULA, e the end user license agreement, and look at the terms. And it pretty much says you get to use it, not you get to sell it. Um, so who owns the content that you licensed from Steam? not Valve. I mean, Valve owns it if it's Portal or Half-Life. But if you buy Call of Duty as a download on Steam, Valve doesn't own that. Activision owns it, and they're not letting you resell it. So the answer is no. I don't think it's likely that we will ever get sharing of digital files. I frankly think that as games migrate to full game downloads, that's better for the publisher, better for the developers, because you can ensure that each person who buys your game paid for it. And it's bad for the consumer because you don't have resale value from the game, which goes back to another question we've answered in this episode. Um, it, that's why you continue to have physical copies of games because people who want to resell them will keep buying them and people who want to buy discounted cheaper games will, uh, will buy used copies. So, nope, I don't think you'll get digital copies traded between user accounts. Uh, we have a question from sifted.net from Major Skittles. I'm sure we didn't have a Major Skittles question before. I remember that name. Wow. I think I must know him in a different life. Some casual gamer friends of mine can't tell the difference between PS3 and PS4 games, whereas they could tell the difference between PS3 and PS2 games. I'm about to really embarrass myself here because I'm, I'm going to put myself in that former category or in that category. Uh, we are reaching the point of diminishing returns with graphics. So, can they continue to keep producing better-looking games if costs keep increasing dramatically? So, I was just telling somebody this, and I, I was only half kidding. Um, as I've said many times on on my old show, The Pack Attack, uh, I was addicted to Fallout Three. So I probably put 200 hours in that game. And I only recently started Fallout 4. I literally have a couple hours in and I'm like at level eight because I keep getting killed. I, uh, I, was, I was trying to actually march right through the main quest and immediately I didn't even understand what this meant until, until a, a pop-up told me this. But there are all these little guys with skulls on their, on their shoulder and or on their, their health bar. And that means that they can kick my ass, and I didn't actually realize that. So I, I'm, I've been taking on guys who keep killing me. Um, anyway, I was just telling somebody this the other day. I only played a couple hours, but I'm having trouble actually remembering how Fallout 3 looked worse. Like, I'm looking at Fallout 4, and I will say the character animation is not any better in Fallout 4. Now, I imagine the textures are sharper. They, I'm sure that they are, but I don't really feel like it. Like, I, it looks like the same game to me, which is cool. And I like it, and it's familiar, and I know what I'm doing. And, and certainly, there's more to do. But graphically, it looks the same. I mean, I certainly have many, many more choices to scrap items and build things. I mean, that's cool. But it looks the same to me. So, I would say... It, totally fair. I am a casual gamer. I don't, you know, I don't play more than probably 10 hours a month typically. And 
I have trouble where I absolutely instantly could tell the difference between PS3 and PS2. Yeah, we're at the point of diminishing returns of the graphics. And look, people can tell the difference between 30 and 60 frames per second, and they can tell the difference between 60 and 120, but not it's not as discernible a difference. And we're not at 120 yet. Um, but you know, I think I, somebody once on, on uh, my favorite site, NeoGAF, somebody once pointed out to me that if, if you pop a little black dot on a white background every thousandth frame, that people can see it. So you, you can see a thousand frames a second, I and mean, you have, actually can. Uh, you can see the black dot flash, but that's a stark contrast. Most people, unless they're looking side by side, can't tell the difference between, between 4K and 1080p. I mean, you, you can tell that, that 4K looks great, but I honestly think most people, if they were watching a 4K TV without knowing that it was 4K, they, they really wouldn't know. Live events, yes. Movies, probably not. And even then, if they could tell the difference, they'd say, it looks really sharp. It looks really bright. But no, you're right. We're at the point of diminishing returns of the graphics. So what do you do? And your, your qualifier was, so can they continue to keep producing better looking games if costs keep increasing dramatically? No, they can't and they won't. Um, the publishers will cheat. And what the publishers will do is they'll trick you into thinking the game looks better. Um, and you know, you've heard stories about all these 30 frame a second late cycle PS3 games, you know, because they, they couldn't do it. They're all 60 now and they'll trick you with some cut scenes that run at even a faster frame rate and look really, really good. But no, I think that, you know, look at the, the animations in Fallout 4. The lips move funny. They don't exactly match the words. The, you know, the people's faces aren't that sharp. And we don't care. Um, I don't want to play a game where if I'm shooting something, I really think I killed something. I just want to play a game where I get the enemy out of the way so I can go grab the loot and move on to the next quest. Um, so I, I think no, I don't think we're actually going to ever get to the point, especially in shooter games, where it looks so real that it makes you sick to your stomach. And you know, so I don't think we're going to want to uh, watch guts spew out in, in, when we've got somebody. I think you just want to see like their shirt turn red when you shoot them and you're kind of done with it and then you move on. Uh, no, there's, there's a point of diminishing your turns. And let me use a really good analogy. Games are like porn. Okay, everybody likes to look at porn, but do you really want to see all the pimples on on the actor's butt? I don't, you know, male or female. I don't think so. So you know, we like we like our movie stars, porn or other, as long as they have makeup and they look perfect and they look beautiful. And if you start getting too close and you see all the blemishes, it's just not as fun. So no, I think we want our games to have no blemishes. Want them to look nice and clean, but not too real, because it's just not as fun if you actually think you just killed somebody. The better question is, then, do we have a next console cycle? And, you know, I probably have misstated this in the past. I've called this the last console cycle. I don't think this is the last time Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo make a console. I think this is the last and most successful console cycle. The next one will come, it won't be as successful. The next one after that will come, and it won't be as successful as the next one. And they'll just keep diminishing because I don't think there's a reason to upgrade. And I guess it's like, if all you do on your PC is word processing, do you really need to upgrade your microprocessor? And the answer is no, you don't, and you won't. I mean, a 3.5 gigahertz CPU is plenty fast. For word processing. None of us can type as fast as that thing can process. So what's the point? I think that's what, what happens with consoles. So good question. Okay, fellow babies, it's time for this week's bold prediction. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about Ubisoft and you know whether Ubisoft uh, has to do something defensive to fend Vivendi off. And obviously in the past I've talked about how Ubisoft could you know pay green mail and buy the shares back. One other uh, potential outcome, and I think this is, I, I, I'm calling it a bold prediction. I don't actually think this will happen, but I think it's interesting and it's an interesting possibility, is I could see Ubisoft approaching Take-Two. 
to be a white knight and have take two ride in on its horse and save the damsel in distress ubisoft from the aggressive ogre of vivendi uh, i could see take two acquiring ubisoft which means that vivendi's stake would be cut in half uh, you know instead of 10 or 15 percent they'd have five or seven percent and i think a combined ubisoft and take two is a very strong company um, a lot of people you know love take two love their games um, my only knock on take two has always been that they don't produce their great content rapidly enough i think if you put the two companies together you've got a really perfect combination of you got a kind of a complete package. You've got some sports, you've got some wrestling, you've got some Just Dance, you've got you know, action adventure, uh, Assassin's Creed, you've got Grand Theft Auto, you've got Far Cry, you've got Red Dead. It is a match made in heaven. And combined, those guys are pretty formidable. I mean, they're not quite as big as EA or Activision, but they would be. I think they would get there pretty quickly. So I think that would be a really interesting combination. I think it would foil Vivendi's ability to take over. I think that if you can get rid of duplicate overhead, it's a much stronger company and very, very profitable. And I actually think that, uh, that you know, the management of Take-Two would work really well with the management of Ubisoft. I think they're very complementary styles. I think the Ubisoft guys would work really, really well with the Rockstar guys. And I think that all of them would learn from one another. I can you know, only imagine if you let the Rockstar guys put their spin on Assassin's Creed, how cool that game could be. So I think that's something that should happen if Vivendi gets to become too much of a threat to Ubisoft. I'm not predicting that it will happen, but I think it's something really interesting to think about. Well, it's uh, holidays rapidly approaching. And so in my house, we celebrate Christmas, but I've lived in homes before that celebrated Hanukkah, and I wish all of my fellow babies a happy whatever holiday you, you celebrate. If you don't celebrate at you know holidays, I hope you still get gifts of great games, and I hope that you have a wonderful remainder of 2015 as we look forward to a killer start to 2016. Thanks for joining us on Sifted.net. And I wish all of you guys a prosperous holiday and a happy new year.